Do you know what? I am never a fan of doing introductions, solo introductions. They always have less energy than the actual conversation I'm going to have with a guest. So I'm going to keep this solo intro pretty damn short. What you're about to hear is uh, it's my first sort of guest interview for, for quite a while, I think. And it's myself and the wonderful filmmaker and wonderful person, Terry Zaki. Now, if you're not familiar with Terry's work and Terry's name, you kind of will be by the end of this uh, this one hour podcast. I saw Terry online. I've been a fan of a documentary that he, I don't see. I don't want to tell you what he's done because it kind of ruins the whole point, doesn't it? Um, but I've been a fan of his work for quite a while, and I saw him on Twitter one night, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to message him and I'm going to try and set up a podcast interview. I did. We did, and this is the conversation you're about to hear. I had an absolute blast talking to him. Uh, really, really nice guy. Yes, Terry, that's you. And I really enjoyed not only revisiting some of the films that you're connected with. Again, I'm not giving them away at the minute. People will learn very quickly what uh, what work you've done. But uh, so I'd like a triple bill of things that you were involved with, and I enjoyed them all. So thank you, Terry, for taking the time out to have a conversation with me. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this uh I don't know, as a dull, possibly dull solo introduction from me. I promise once we get past this theme song in a second, there's a little bit of a trailer and then you're into a whole different realm of actually decent conversation. So uh, enjoy, hopefully, and let me know what you think. More to the point, let Terry know what you think. That's nine-year-old me and my sister. Two years earlier, she and my father witnessed the aftermath of a sexual assault. So my dad made a movie about it called I Spit on Your Grave. Who would have thought I'd be making a movie about his movie 40 years later? I don't know whether to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, Terry. It's, uh, it's good evening to me. <laughs> I'm guessing it's good. Good evening to you, yes. Is it afternoon to you? I think I suspect it is. It is not. It is oh. 11 o'clock in the morning over here in Damn sunny it. California. <laughs> Damn it. I'll start again. Good morning. There we go. And um, good evening to you. <laughs> how, how, just to let you know, the day ahead is pretty good. You know, the weather's a bit hit and miss because, uh, you know, that's, that's the sort of future you've got. So... You know, got you. Oh, here <laughs> we've had we've had like 90, 95 degree weather for almost two months every day straight, and wow. it's just completely wiltering me away. You know, just, <laughs> I hate the heat. <laughs> here in the UK, we had a a, catas- a catastrophic heat wave for like four days. Where I, I heard. Ki- I kid you not, the news channels were telling us not to go outside because it was a threat to life. It was like <laughs> three degrees normal. No, it's three degrees hotter than it normally is on a pretty good summer. And wow! Cr- wow! Absolutely crazy. Well, I don't think you would survive out here if that if they're warning you about that. You no, know? no, not at all. I've been to places in the U.S. where you get off the plane and it's like being hit by a fiery sledgehammer. So, exactly, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and there are, there are places that are more hot than California. My my mom uh, used to live in Arizona, and when I would visit her, I remember feeling that heat as if you're opening an oven. And yeah. 450 degrees of heat is like flying into your face. That's what it felt like. You know? so. So, so here we had like four or five days of sun. Then it started to rain. And then people were complaining, oh, the heat wave didn't last. <laughs> the UK is a wonderful bunch of complainers for the most. Not everybody, wonderful. But, but a lot of them. So It's acceptable. Um, Absolutely acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> so the hardest part for these sort of conversations, we've already started, by the way, that's how I do it. It's, I, I don't treat this as any form of interview type thing. It's literally a conversation that just happens to get I recorded so everybody exactly. else can join in. Uh, it the hardest, sounds fantastic. The hardest part for me is always like, oh, what do I start off talking about? That is the question. <laughs> um, and I, I'm going to start off mentioning that I have had a triple bill of films that you've been involved with over the past two or three days. Uh, so nice. you know, this isn't nice. just growing up with I Spit on Your Grave. That Although I did rewatch that, that was the first thing that I'd watched. I also watched your film Holy Hollywood. Fantastic. I love that. You know, that, that, that film was very close to my heart. And, uh, 
yeah, I'm very happy that it's out there for everyone to, to see and hopefully enjoy. Yep. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. And I am about an hour off finishing uh, I Spit on Your Grave Deja Vu. Okay, I, gotcha. <laughs> I, I didn't realize the running time that it was, so I mistimed thinking, well, it, I've got this only, amount of time. It's only two and a half hours long, you know. <laughs> do, do you know what, though? I think, because I looked at the, the, the running time, so it basically, I'm not, and I'm not going to spoil any of those films, although we'll probably get into some spoilers for I Spit on Your Grave because it did come out in the 70s, so, you know. Right, exactly. So, there we go. Um, but uh, where, was, where was I headed with that one? Yeah, it got to a certain point in Deja Vu, and I'm thinking, this film's going to finish really fast because it's been on an hour, and it's got to this part of the plot. And then I thought, I'm going to just... I think I was looking up to to uh, see where some of the cast had been in before because I recognised some of the faces. I'm like, oh, I know this face. Let me look right. at it. And I looked on IMDb and I'm like, sure, that can't be two hours and 28 minutes. Because it that, <laughs> that type of film feels like it's probably going to be a 90 to 100 minute type movie. Right, exactly. And I'm like... I hear you on that. And then I realised the, the pacing in Deja Vu is perfect. Because I've now watched, I think, 93 minutes I'm up to. I could watch that for another two, three hours. I think that the, Interesting. So I don't know whether... I'm not going to say was the pacing on purpose. So I would hope it would be. But it's just for that type of film, it's very rare you get a two-and-a-half-hour film. But it, it doesn't is. feel... I mean, obviously, it doesn't feel like two-and-a-half hours because I've watched 90 minutes, but I've got the other hour to watch when, when I've finished chatting with yourself. But it didn't feel like it had been on for as long as it had. Right. I, I, I get it. It does move along. It does, it does somehow. The story just keeps propelling it forward, you know. And, yeah, I, I hear you on that. And every turn, you never know what to expect. No, there was, um, there was a bit on the church steps, which I didn't expect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, yes, I hear you on um, that, exactly. So, and this is the sort of thing with the, I mean, my story with I Spit on Your Grave, I can hear me are going, dead a woman, which that part on the end of your documentary just had me laughing my head off. When everybody's saying the yes, title, there's always one awkward person hilarious. that says dead a woman. That cracked yes, me up. Wonderful Yes, end. yes, exactly. I, I hear you. It's so funny because every time <laughs> I had somebody interview in my documentary, you know, at, toward the end, I said, please give me what the trailer always said. I spit on your grave. Mm. And everybody gave that. And when I asked my father, you know, well, Camille did it all happily. And then I asked my father, and he goes, Day of the Woman. Day of the Woman. <laughs> so I'm guessing he prefers the title Day of the Woman to I Spit on Your Grave. He does prefer the title. It, it's, it's what his intention was. His intention was never to make an exploitation film. His intention was to show the brutality and the ugliness of what sexual assault is. And the title of Day of the Woman for him was very befitting because it was rather more innocent and, and not exploitative, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, when Jerry Gross, that mastermind distributor, took over the film Day of the Woman, you know, the stipulation was that he can change the title to anything he wants, change the campaign, change the trailer, the poster, and that's what he did. And, you know, here we are with the same movie, Day of the Woman, now titled I Spit on Your Grave, known to be an exploitation movie now, <laughs> or not by others, depending I, I, who you are and how you feel. <laughs> it's massively divisive, that film, isn't it? Even massively. to this date. You know, yes. Even to this day, yes. it's still yes. divisive. I, I was telling some people at my, my night job that I was speaking with yourself and I mentioned the film that you're involved with and you were in. Uh, for the wonderful fee of ten dollars, apparently. Yes, uh, that's exactly. Pretty good. As a child, and that's a lot of bubble gums. Yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, and I had some people that had seen the film, and then some that hadn't, but they'd heard of it. And the ones who had heard of it but hadn't seen it had had this sort of wince. They were like, "Ooh, you know that right. sort of." So they know about it, but they haven't watched yes. it type thing. They're scared of watching it. I think. I get that all the time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what is what is your reaction when people find out you were involved? In that film, is it a similar? Oh, you were, and I bet they're fascinated. Going, tell me more. Tell me. It's like you know, watch yeah, my I've documentary. Had, I've had a lot of different reactions. You know, like uh, I mean, I have many different stories, but you know, one of them was like a friend of mine. You know, who never saw the film. I showed him. I gave him the DVD, and then he gets back to me, and he's like, Terry, 
I got, I got to tell you something, you know, I, I really wasn't uh, expecting to see what I saw. And I got to be honest, I was never more disgusted in my life. I, I'm, I was like horrified and disgusted and it made me sick and I wanted to throw up afterwards, you know. And this guy is like a, a, a filmmaker guy, you know, and I thought he would look at it in a different way. But no, it really, truly affected him. And then I get other people that are like, oh, my God, this is like the best revenge movie I have ever ever seen the fact that a woman takes on her own revenge and her father or her uncle or a boyfriend doesn't take it for her, you know, applauds to that. So I get everything all over the place. And that's what makes it so fascinating is that, as you said earlier, it's it's massively divided where people stand on this film, whether it, it, it whether it's uh, misogynistic or whether it promotes horror against women or, 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 it's, or it empowers women. You know, there's people are on the fence, either one side or the other or in the middle. And that's what makes it more amazing is that people still are, you know, constantly talking about where they stand with this film. See, I see it as a perfectly balanced film, the first one I'm referring to, because, yes, you've got the brutality towards, you know, Camille's character. Uh, but then you've got the second half of the film, which is her going, all right, I'm not having this anymore. I'm now going to be the avenging angel and I'm going to be the brutal one against these you know, scumbags that deserve it. So th- I think people right. that think it's a film that just promotes violence against women, they clearly haven't seen the second half of the movie. Exactly. Or if they have, they were so horrified by the constant visualness of the you know, one assault after another, after another, and it just, it's just doesn't end, you know? And so they're just so horrified and appalled by that, that it's hard to see the second half in a positive light. I think that's, I mean, uh, my sort of relationship with the film, I was born in 1971. The, the film hit the video stores in the UK, 82. So I was 11. Yep. I was way too young to watch it at 11. I didn't see it until I was older than that. But I remember the cover. I used to finish school, and my parents didn't get home till a couple of hours after I'd finished school. So I would every day walk around the video stores, look at the Betamax, going, oh, that's not got a future, uh, and then look at the VHS <laughs> section, and I would just look at the cover art. And I remember films like The Boogeyman, Happy Birthday to Me, Driller Killer, and mm-hmm. I spit on your grave with that the the iconic you know Demi Moore's rear end, which she does mention in her biography. Right. She mentions right. that covering exactly. her biography. Exactly, exactly. And, and I would look at that going, okay, so she's she's you know broken five men. I I never realised there was there was five <laughs> until I was watching the documentary. I'm like, oh, it mentions five, doesn't it? It's only four. That's right. So that so that went over my head. But I would just look at it and go, what what's happened to the woman? What's caused her to I would try and make up what this film was about in my head. And I knew it was going to be a brutal film because you can tell. And then I moved to England from Scotland in 1986. And my aunt was a huge fan of this film. She had a a VHS of it. And I remember walking in the living room one day and she was watching it. And it was the (laughs) it was the crustacean scene in the bath. Oh my! So I'm like, (laughs) what are you watching? Turned around, left the room. Went back in later on. It's you know the speedboat part. I saw that part as well. I'm like, ah, I don't want to watch that <laughs> film. This looks horrendous and brutal and crazy and scary. And it was probably two years after that. And I think I, I saw an interview online where you'd mentioned this very thing, where people sort of think, right, I'm going to see how tough I am. You know, I can't yes, go, I can't yes. go out in the wilderness and hunt a bear anymore because that's bad, and a bear would <laughs> kill right. me. But I'm, I'm going to be all manly, and I'm going to watch this horror film, and I'm going to get to the end, and I'm going to be super tough, and I'm going to be a, you know, a grown-up. And it's one of yeah. those films, and it, it's, it's a traumatic movie. It's not one you sit down with a big bucket of popcorn and go, oh, do you know what no. I'm going to do? I'm going to watch that again. But it's still no. one hell of an impactful film, even decades after. Yes, yeah, it's it's not a date movie. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, no, no. It might be a first date, but there ain't going to be no second date. Exactly. <laughs> so that was my relationship with the film, anyway. And obviously, living in the UK, it was notorious because the you know the UK government just went ban all the movies, get rid of them all. Exactly. 
which so, just really brought it more attention to all the titles that are on the nasties list. It just brought more attention. And even nowadays, you have many people that are seeking out those titles just to see what in the world did they ban or, you know, like it, it's it's really fascinating what movies made that list and uh, so, some movies that didn't, you know, that were made by studios that yeah. did not get on that list. Uh, so it's really it's fascinating. It is fascinating. So it's uh, it is a film that I've revisited. I'm a little bit worried about the 4K restoration, though, because one of the things and I haven't seen the 4K restoration, but one of the things I love about the, the I Spit on Your Grave is it's. It has the same sort of feel as Last House on the Left and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So it feels... Interesting it's, that you say that, you know. Okay. I, I, I hear that everywhere, and I'm very familiar with both movies. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of my favorite films, same, yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, but I, I feel that they're, they're all kind of in their own world, you know, um, even Last House on the Left, I, I see it as a very different film than I Spit on Your Grave. Hmm. Um, but I, I, I love all three, by the way. You know, you. But a lot of people compare them together, and, uh, and that's okay. You know, it, it, People see things the way they see things, th through their own filters, and uh, I, I get it. It's only when you start comparing it to like Batman and Robin, you might think, oh, oh I've got a bit of a problem here, <laughs> if you're being compared right. to that. But I <laughs> yeah. think for me, those three films, storyline, they're not, I don't think they're too similar. But it's just the feel of the production of it. I can see the feel. Yeah, they I can feel, see that. Yes. They yes. feel um, in the same way sort of David Fincher's Seven, you know, where it, it doesn't feel like a studio movie because you Yeah, more not gritty. Gritty. Right, right. Gr grimy, maybe, to use a word. Yeah. But, but yeah. in a complimentary way. And, and you're working on a budget. You're definitely working yeah. on a budget, you know. Yeah. Which is more difficult, you know. Making a movie on a low budget is, is more difficult than making a movie on a bigger budget where you have money to just solve all your problems, you know. And I, um, I think that um, – and I, I started watching the remake a few years ago, and I, I didn't finish that because I just – I'm like, nope, can't, my, my brain's not – my, 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 brain, <laughs> my brain's not in the mood for this sort of brutality. For them. <laughs> I did plan to go back and watch all the sequels and everything, but I, I didn't have enough time because I've just finished all my work night shifts this morning, uh, hence right. me jumping to Deja Vu. Um, gotcha. I love how Deja Vu – has the same feel to the original one yes yeah mayor succeeded with that for yes. sure yes did. I'm still and the fact that camille keaton came back to reprise her role as jennifer hills was really exciting it was i want that book <laughs> it looks like a good book. i actually have a couple over <laughs> here that i'm cherishing yeah i'm holding on to those i, know, I so. don't blame you uh, yeah, but, we had a few copies, but I managed to grab one or two. <laughs> I've got them somewhere. You, know? <laughs> you haven't the one that you've not got the one that's had somebody scroll fuck her on the cover of you because that. You know, I don't think never. I do have that one actually. No. <laughs> never deface a book; it's terrible unless it's a exactly. signature on the inside. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I went into Deja Vu today. I was expecting like a sort of retread to "I Spit on Your Grave." Which is fine. I don't mind that in some sequel. I was very surprised how it isn't a retread um, of the first one. So I, the writing on it is very clever. I'm not going to go into two details because, you know, people will yeah. watch it because it's still, still newish. It's newer than the first it is. one. Correct. Um, Correct. Yeah. It's a whole different movie. Uh, yeah. Deja Vu is an entirely different film, although it has Camille Keaton in it. And it is the direct continuation of the 1978 story and where Jennifer Hills is in her life, you know, this long later. Um, it's, it's a different movie. It's not the same type of, uh, of, of a film that the original is. But I think that's the beauty of it is that you're expecting a carbon copy and yet it's not. You know, I think it's got its own universe in itself in terms of the type of film it is. And uh, I think it's rather fascinating what Mayer did with it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very proud to have been a part of it. I did, I edited the movie, I, I co-produced it and um, did everything in between as well. So yeah, I, 
a lot of hard work on that one. <laughs> I, I think it's paid off. I think it's great. I love how sort of there may be some people who haven't seen the first one for a while. There are clips of the first one in Deja Vu, which will just remind you of a lot of the first one. So, yes, which I think yes. was how easy was it to edit those clips from that were shot in like 76, 77 into a film that was shot sort of 2018, 2019? I think they, they complemented each other quite well, actually. Um, you know, and I've read a lot of uh, in a lot of like little reviews that you know people really love seeing the, the flashbacks of the '78. Um, so yeah, no, it, it, it was like a, a perfect marriage. It worked out great. Was it's like linking, a, linking the two together, like a date night double bill. Let's watch that one. And then watch Deja Vu. Let's let's watch them both together. Get the popcorn. Yeah, yeah. I think it was necessary to put some flashbacks to you know whether you're familiar with the first film or not. But if you are, it just brings out the horror and terror, you know, and memories that she went through in in the 1978 film. So I mean, it's one of those. I was watching it, thinking somebody could watch that if they hadn't seen the first one. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so, for sure, that you could easily understand what's going on without knowing what the first film's all about. Yeah, because you do get that. And that's obviously due to the wonderful writing, the wonderful direction, and you're a great editing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I just wanted to give a final shout out to like Jamie Bernadette, who's absolutely amazing in Deja Vu. Fair play to her. She's, she is. She, she was the one that I, look, I wanted to look up. I'm like, I've seen her in something else. And I'm like, let's look it up. And that's when I discovered the running time. I'm like, that can't be right, surely. But it is. You know, we were very lucky to have three amazing female actresses in this movie. Camille Keaton, Maria Olsen, and Jamie Bernadette. You know, and yeah. it was just, I mean, the combination of those three talents coming together and the portrayals of their characters on the screen with the storyline that Mayer, you know, presented to us, you know, it, it's, it was just a great, great combination of, of females, you know, to, to host this movie and, you know, to star in this film. So, yeah, I, I love all of them. I love all the, the actors that we chose for the movie and uh yeah it's it's just a joy yeah. maria plays it perfectly but her character's mean oh like her. yes she she's is. mean oh, she's yeah. mean but <laughs> oh, she yes, looks she like is. she's having so much fun you know yes 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 so yeah well, well she's johnny's wife you know she and is. she's she's taken on his hat <laughs> and she's taken on his boots more or less and uh she's doing what she had to do to to clear her mind of the uh the evilness around her, you know? Yep. So. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, church step scene will stay with me for a long time. I was, <laughs> I was not expecting that. I, was, I nearly described it as a plot twist, but I, don't, I hate the phrase twist because it's just a plot, isn't it? It's like, right. I was a twist. It's the plot. Uh, it, right. it went in a direction I didn't think it was going to go in. So. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. So, um, but, yeah, looking back on the documentary, how has the – the the feedback being from the documentary it's been very positive um you know the film was actually nominated as best documentary of 2019 by the rondo hayton awards and um yeah i've been getting a lot of great feedback and people are sending me messages telling me how much they like it and they never they never knew that camille and mayor were married they didn't know it was Demi Moore's butt on the poster. And so, you know, I'm getting a lot of nice feedback. And so it's been really a joy and a pleasure for me to tell the story that I know about my father and the, the reason why he made this movie when encountering a, a, a rape victim coming out of the woods, bloodied and beaten, jaw broken, and he brought her to the police station and they were questioning her. Why were you there? Why were you dressed that way? Why did you take the shortcut? As if it was her fault, you know. And my father was furious and went back home and he wrote a script and added the fantasy of what someone would do to get revenge on creeps that do this kind of horrors, you know. So it's, it's been a real joy for me to tell the story of not only the truth of why Mayer made this film, but the struggles that he went through to get this movie distributed, originally as Day of the Woman, and then when the mastermind Jerry Gross came along and changed the title and campaign 
to I spit in the grave. And then here we are, you know, with uh, a whole franchise and continuous, you know, <laughs> endless talks about the subject matter. So it's 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 been a real privilege to make this documentary, to tell the story and to bring a lot of light to it. Um, and I'm really glad that people are watching it and, you know, feeling what I'm trying to express. I think this, the story when we learn about the, the woman walking out of the park, that is obviously horrific. Yes, uh, yes, it is horrific. Because yeah. uh, you, you probably think that, that when people write films like I Spit on Your Grave, it's somebody sitting in a house, oh, I'm going to write this film about this, that, and the other. When you hear that story, you go, okay, I look at this script in a whole different matter now. This exactly. is it's not an exploitation movie, as you'd mentioned, but a lot of people will have seen it as that, I think. Mayer was triggered by that one moment of him encountering that teenage girl. He was triggered by that. And we would not be here talking if that moment never happened. And quite frankly, I wish that moment had mm. never happened. But it did. It triggered him. And he just went and made a movie about this subject. But like I said, added the fantasy of the revenge. You know, and but what's interesting is that and, and this is the difference between the remake and the original. In the remake, Jennifer Hills, the modern Jennifer Hills, played by Sarah Butler, she gets revenge and puts these brutal traps together and she gets them. You know, in the original, Jennifer Hills uses her sexuality to, you know, invite a couple of them along. And, you know, that to me, a lot of people uh, uh, were ve very either very angry about or understood it. And that was another part of the divisive divisiveness of where the audience stood, you know, saying, wow, who would ever who would ever allow men to do that after what they did? Uh, but but Jennifer Hills was creating a whole trap for them. And that's how she did it. And yes, it's very controversial. But that's how she did it. <laughs> she was, yeah, she knew exactly the end game that she wanted to get to, and she used whatever was available to her in order to get them into that trap. Exactly, that way was her weapon. It. Her yeah. sexuality became her weapon. Yeah, rather than becoming like the A team and just you know making booby traps and blowing stuff. them away. She, exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> get me, a, get me a welding kit and something else. That'll work. I'll, I'll build right. something. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I also read somewhere that you had more or less finished the documentary and then Camille went, oh, I'll, I'll be on camera. And you yes. went back and you inserted. What's the process of that? I can't imagine what that's yeah. like to finish something and then go, oh, actually, I've not finished it. I'm going to put all this really cool extra stuff in. Well, what really happened was I was working on the documentary for about a year. At the time, I titled it. I spit on your grave, the man and madness behind it all. And it was just really about my father talking about, I spit on your grave, you know. And then about a year later, I'm like, wow, it would be really great to have Camille on board. And I spoke to Camille and, you know, she came on board. And then when I got her, I'm like, I got to get the four actors. <laughs> you know? so, and then it just widened up to where I ended up finding the production manager, Bill Taskell. You know, I found a few other people. So and then I decided, let me speak to some fans around the world. You know, <laughs> let me see what they have to say. And so it was really rather fascinating how it started with just, you know, me simply calling it I spit in the grave, the man and madness behind it all. And then it became growing up with I spit in the grave because I did grow up with this film. I was the little boy in the 1978 film. Uh, playing along with my sister, Tammy. You know, we were the kids of Johnny from the gas station. So I did grow up with this movie. I've seen every trial and tribulation my father has gone through trying to get the movie sold. And, you know, I remember walking down Broadway when I was maybe about, I was in my teens, and there was Tower Video. And then to my total shock in the front on the big display, I saw maybe 150 boxes of I Spit in Your Grave, you know, there, like on sale. 
And it was at some ridiculous price of like, I don't know, $79.99 at the time. It was something yeah. crazy. And I was just amazed. Like in the front window, my father's movie is there. I'm like, wow, this is this is fascinating and great. So yeah, yeah. So I thought growing up with I Spit in the Grave would be a good title. It did mushroom into what it became after I got Mayor and Camille. I knew I had to go full full out, you know, which I did. And so there, there you have it. I mean, here in the UK, trying to get hold of a VHS of I Spit in Your Grave from the, the 80s onwards was like gold dust. Yes, I've yeah. heard. I've heard, yeah. I've heard people actually got prosecuted for owning a copy. Yeah, they did, yeah. I mean, I don't know anybody specifically that got prosecuted for owning a specific copy of that one, but I've seen a lot of documentaries from video store owners um, and I, I ran a video store when the film was officially released in the late 90s, early 2000s, I believe, in the UK. Uh, I've not checked the date on that. Nice. And, and I bought a couple of copies of that, put it in the video store, and people were going mad because they'd never seen this film. They'd heard of it. They'd heard about its reputation, and they wanted to see it. Some liked it. Some watched. And I think sometimes it's like when people watch The Exorcist nowadays, if they've never seen it before, they go, it's kind of slow. Uh, not a lot happens. But if you watch right. it through the eyes of when the film was made, terrifying. Yes. And I, The Exorcist is also one of my favorite films. Yes, very terrifying. And I Spit on Your Grave is one of those as well, I think. You know, uh, people who had watched all the Saw movies and, you know, like, oh, it's okay. It's just, you know, but I've, I've seen things like that. Well, you haven't, but that's what they would say. But if you watch it and think this was filmed in 76, that's, that's pretty harsh. So. Right. Modern horror films are a bit different than the older 70s, 80s films, you know, and, um, you know, so new audiences are, are getting their brains are getting trained to uh, expect movies to be a certain way. Yeah. So when they go to look at older films, it's, you know, sometimes you have to have a little more patience for that. And, um, you know, but if you just give it the time. When it's all said and done, you know, it should leave you with something. And if it leaves you with something, then the, the filmmakers did their job, yep. you know. So I Spit on Your Grave, the 70s one, leaves me with a lot of some things. <laughs> still, <laughs> still does. And yes, they, and, me too, honestly. Me too. And what, so what was it like? I mean, obviously you were like nine years old when you appeared in the first one. Now, if we fast forward a little bit to when you're in your teens, maybe like 15, 16, this film would have been out there. People, you know, would have been in the video stores and people would have... Just, what, yeah, what, just. What yeah. was the reaction like when people found out you were connected with it when you were a teenager? You know, it wasn't as popular then. So, it, you know, I mean, it, it may have been like people may have heard about it, but... My circle, I really didn't get much, you know, ex excited people around me when they heard about that, actually. It, it became in my 20s when people started, like, you know, when they heard that, you know, my father made this, you know, notorious film, that I would start to get some reactions. But my late teens were rather calm and quiet, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Like, no, I, I can't remember any standout situation where somebody who said anything about you know whether it was positive or negative in my teens really so what, what does mayor think now though i mean this is like 40 40 something years after the film has come next out. year's the 45th anniversary next year from 78 to 2023 we got 45 years on its back wow yeah that is impressive especially when you look at the fact it's not a studio film right Right, exactly. So um, I'm guessing he would have hoped that this would be the case. So in like 45 years, we're going to be celebrating the, the anniversary of Day of the Woman. Um, you know, he, it, he, he basically, he expected this film to last about five years. Because, you know, a lot of movies, they, they see the sunlight and then they, you know, see darkness forever, basically. Um, or for most of its existence. Uh and here we are. It's it's beyond sunlight. It's become a franchise. I, I would have never, ever have called this or predicted this, um, you know, even in the early 2000s. I, I would just think, oh, I'll, here I'll be sitting in my life at this time <laughs> in my life with just the original. And But no, I, you know, so... 
but Mayer, you know, Mayer, he's, you know, he made this movie and um, he made it with good intentions to show the ugliness of, you know, sexual assault. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. It's definitely got one hell of a legacy to it, hasn't it? <laughs> it do, it really does. It's amazing. It, it's, it does have an, a crazy legacy to it, you know. And there's so much to it. And I've heard so many podcasts about people talking about the films and people's reactions that are so different. And the people bring up things in the movie that I never thought was even a thought, you know. And it, it's really it's 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 really mind boggling. What's one of the things that people bring up that you thought, why, why are they bringing that up? I wouldn't have even thought that was a thing. Well, I mean, there's so many things. Just like, like even when, like, after the assault, Jennifer Hills is on the hammock, you know, back with her writing. And then, uh, no, actually before the assault, I'm sorry, before the assault, she's on the hammock writing. And the two men come riding their motorboats and the motorboat is like driving, pointing upward. You know, showing like the sign of an like an erection. You know? <laughs> wow! So, and even Gunter Kleeman in the film, you know, in my documentary, you know, talked about that. And I've heard a lot of people say that. And I, me, I would never think of that. I'm looking at the boat, and they're just watching her riding the boat. So there's been so many like interesting like you know point of views from people uh, about male gaze and you know the things that Jennifer Hills does or. The, the, some things that the characters do in the movie uh it, it's it's just i it's things that even mayor says that he's never you know <laughs> even thought about so <laughs> i'm i'm sure at the time it was like right the sun's going down in about an hour we need to get the shot of, of camille of on the ball film it and exactly. it just so happens but uh yeah <laughs> precisely yeah, yeah low budget filmmaking we've got one take do it exactly. do it exactly and, and I have to say, I you know Nuri Haviv, who was the mm. cinematographer on the '78 film, you know he was like a, a second father to me, and and I really believe he did such a beautiful job filming the uh, the the production. And you know you brought up the 4K earlier, yeah. and you know this is actually the first time that the uh, remastered 4K will be released in the UK by Kaleidoscope Home Entertainment. Uh, comes out September 26 with a bunch of extras, even a Camille Keaton commentary, which I haven't heard yet, which I'm so anxious to hear. Um, but you know, the 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 restoration of the 78 is so crisp and clean, and really shows you the beauty of what Nuri Haviv, the cinematographer, captured, and the gorgeous scenery, the lake, the trees. The wilderness, the just the red, the blood, you know, everything is so crisp and clear. And you know, I, I've always said that this type of film, way back in the days when it was th in theaters, you know, those film prints went through a lot of abuse, play after play after play, and then they become scratchy and there's dirt, you know. So you're watching this very dirty, gritty-looking print which makes the film feel more exploitative. So here we are, you've got this beautiful 4K restoration, you know, by Kaleidoscope coming out. When you watch this, you will see this film in such a clear see-through window vision that it, it will blow you away, the clarity of it. And it's so clean and beautiful. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's gorgeous what, what's, what's been done with the, with the restoration. And watching Deja Vu today with the shots that you've edited in from the original I Spit on Your Grave is the one thing that's making me look forward to the 4K restoration. So even though I think it'll, for me, it'll remove some of the, the, the griminess of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yes. Last House on the Left, yes. the, the, the flashback scenes in Deja Vu, which aren't, you know, aren't the 4k restoration correct the, the reds <laughs> and the the locations and the trees and the color palette looks stunning in the flashbacks so yes, that's what's does. making me think imagine how stunning these are going to look in 4k you will be really surprised because i was surprised and i have seen this film in, in so many different uh, you know variations from betamax to film prints to you know gritty vhs copies you name it i've seen it all but when i saw this i was i said to myself my goodness 
Like, I cannot believe how gorgeous this film looks with such a horrifying, terrible subject matter, like a gruesome, awful, ugly subject matter. But yet the visuals are, are so, so exceptionally beautiful. So that combination in itself will be a treat to have this, you know, just for that combination in itself. And I think the stunning visuals by Nuri and obviously the direction by Mayer takes it away from the exploitation that people so accuse it of. An exploitation movie yes. would be just point the camera, capture the brutality, next shot. And it's, and it's clearly music. not that. With, yeah. yeah, yeah. Also like boom, 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 boom. You know, here Mayer used no music. You know, the, 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 the score for him was the sound effects, the wilderness, the, the card, the little Joker card in the back of uh, mm-hmm. Matthew's bicycle, making that clicking noise. You know, those were his, that was his orchestra, was the natural sounds of what's happening in the reality of the story. And to me, that makes it much more powerful than throwing in music, which directs your brain how to feel and react, you know. So now you're on your own. You are on your own. You're watching this movie and there's no music to to tell you otherwise. So you're going through your own experience. And that's what makes it also very unique. It's a bit like life, isn't it? If you're going to walk out into the middle of a road and you're just about to get hit by a car, but you don't realize <laughs> it, you generally don't hear a soundtrack warning you. Exactly. And I don't mean to <laughs> laugh because it's not funny, but, yeah. but the thought of that, that there, that there should be an expected sound, like music beat, you know, just before the impact, you know, is like, you know, kind of crazy. Uh, and yeah, so that's the reality of it is that there is no music. You're on your own and fasten your seatbelt, you know, and just let, let yourself go with it, you know. And uh, you know how many times I hear people saying, oh, I fast forwarded through the, uh, you know, through the assault scenes. I fast forwarded. And, you know, part of me kind of understands that. But if you really want to get the experience of this film and really feel the the revenge part even more so you you really got to watch it in real time yeah definitely to sort of go along with the revenge part you need to see what's caused her to get to that point exactly hide hide, hide behind a pillow that's fine you know hide behind a cushion (laughs) because then you can still hear the screams and and all that sort of stuff so you're still getting it but uh but yeah it's not an easy film to watch for the first time but nor should it be or or the second or the third no i've seen it how many times have I seen it now? Probably five, six times in my life. I mean, I'm 51 now, so it's not like I've watched it six times this week. Um, right, I get it completely. I've seen it on, I get it on grainy VHS. I saw it on a brand new VHS when I had the video store. I've seen it on a imported DVD. Um, and I've probably seen it a couple of times on those same formats as well. But uh, Right. It's a hard movie to get through. It's, yeah. it's a very uncomfortable movie to watch. And, and I guess that's what makes it timeless is that, you know, a lot of older films, they feel outdated and, and people have no patience for that. Uh, this film, somehow it has legs and it still, it still has that punch in the gut that makes you feel whatever it is that you're feeling from it. And, uh, and also I was surprised during my documentary making how many women are major fans of this movie. Mm. You know, I thought it was more of like a, you know, a, a man kind of film to watch. And, but no, so many women are, are really fans of this. And I was very surprised to hear that. And it makes me actually happy to, you know, to find that out. Because there was one woman that you spoke to, and I've forgotten the name, I should have written it down, but she, she starts off by saying that she was assaulted. BJ. BJ, yes. 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 And, and I remember thinking, oh, what's, what's her reaction going to be watching this film? Is it going to be? And, and she did say it triggered her. But then she goes on to say that she's watched it a whole bunch of times. and Within a 24-hour period. Within a 24-hour like period. That, or so a two-day period, yes. That she felt empowered by it. Yeah. And Camille Keaton tells me when she does conventions, many times women come up to her and tell her 
thank you. You know, you're, I, I've been through things that, you know, kind of happened in the movie and this movie made me feel empowered and, it, you know, so it's, it's fascinating to, all, all these stories and, you know, what, what really impresses me the most is that there's so much dialogue, you know, after the movie's done, after the closing credits are over with, there's talk, there's discussion. And that's really what's keeping this movie alive, you know, and, and bringing it to a whole franchise is that, you know, there's been a lot of movies about rape and revenge, yeah. but a lot of them are not done in a way that you want to talk about it to the extent that that I spit in the grave uh, makes you have discussions about, you know, it's there's so much more to this film um, than what you're seeing on the screen, you know, and a lot of people say, well, why didn't she call the police in the original? Well, if you remember in the scene in the house, she's about to call the police and she does. And the person, you know, kicks the phone, you know, yep. uh, I'm sorry if that's a spoiler, but <laughs> <laughs> you know the end result. So it's not a big spoiler, but she does try to call the, uh, the law and that gets taken away from her, obviously. So, yeah, it, it amazes me that there's so much discussion, you know, to this movie after it's done. Even 45 years. People Even 45 are still, years later, yeah. Still talking about it, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Right, exactly. So, so you had shot Holy Hollywood before this, I suspect. Uh, Holy Hollywood was filmed in 1999. I thought so. And the reason that I thought so is because there's a billboard showing Double Jeopardy, the Tommy Lee Jones film. In yes, there. And I'm yes like, exactly. And on IMDb, it says 2021. And I'm, I'm looking at I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty sure we, you know, we lost Mickey Rooney before. Yes, and I'm, somehow and it, so it that got changed. Me. Yeah, it, it's weird. It was 1999, but I, I, I uh, released it in 2021. Um I guess IMDb took that as it, when it was made. So, you know, although my IMDb has been there since 1999, so I found that weird that they changed that. But nonetheless, it was filmed uh, in late 98, early 99. Really, uh, and then, you know, Mickey, that was actually Mickey Rooney's last credit oh, on wow. IMDb. So I had the privilege and honor, I mean, big, big honor of directing Mickey Rooney in a scene, which quite frankly, he didn't need me there. I mean, he, yeah. just, he just took the character on his own. And, you know, I remember he walked, he, he drove in with his, uh, someone drove him in, you know, to the gates of the house. And then he says, hello, everybody. And he literally went to every one of my crew members and shook their hand. And then when he came to me, I said, hello, Mr. Rooney, nice to meet you. And he looked at me, he goes, nobody calls me Mr. Rooney. It's Mickey with a big smile on his face. You know? So, so, you know, then he went and he started rehearsing with, uh, with Tony Leach, the character of Tyler. And about an hour later, Mickey calls me over and says, Terry, come, come look at what we did. And they do the little scene together. And he took the character on so beautifully. I said, Mickey, you don't need me. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Pure class, Mickey Rooney. Isn't he, oh, he's wonderful, and and the dialogue in his movie coming out of his mouth as the character of Grandpa really, really describes Hollywood in the nutshell. You yeah. know how he felt about movies. You know, so I think that movie would be a treat if people saw it. You know, take a look at Holy Hollywood. It's streaming, and I think you'll get a real good feel out of that a good kick out of it well i found it on something called plex which i wasn't familiar nice. with until a couple of weeks ago so you can watch it on there where it does have ads in it but to be honest there's not many ads there's only like exactly there's only like two i got something for a george clooney um cinema film that's coming out so i got that a couple of times but the ads are quick and harmless they're yeah. they're hardly noticeable yep but I wasn't sure what to expect with Holy Hollywood because it's like I'm I'm familiar with your work from from being in I Spit on Your Grave and then making the documentary Growing Up I Spit on Your Grave and I thought <laughs> so you know documentary Holy Hollywood is a narrative film I have no clue and I was looking at some of the credits some of the cast so you have Sal Pacino and I'm like what that's yes. a, that, that is a crazy yes. name uh, you exactly got, was it, was it Father of Al Tony Tarantino. Father of Quentin. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, 
is this is this a documentary with some sort of parody names or something? <laughs> and then one of my favorite names ever, and it's a character name, Candy Warhol. That love just, it, love it. Uh, uh, that's definitely when somebody asks me what are your favorite movie character names, Candy Warhol is going to be up there. I that's love. fantastic. Absolutely I love wonderful. That. So I had no clue what to expect when I press play on on the Plex website, and I loved Holy Hollywood. It felt like. It felt, have you ever seen Empire Records and films no. like Slacker and, and some of the earlier Kevin Smith stuff? Yes, you know I did. Of... I saw Clerks, of yep. course. Uh, I saw The Office recently, which I really liked. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that, that movie was very close to my heart because at the time, I literally owned and operated with uh, a, a couple of partners, uh, you know, an extras casting agency. And one of my partners, Jeff Olin, and I decided to make a movie about our wacky, crazy life running an extras casting business. You know, so we took advantage of all the characters that we knew <laughs> from our files, as yeah. you can see, yeah. you know, because there's a sea of people in this movie, there you is. know, yep. a sea of people. So, yeah, it was really based a little bit loosely on my life at the time, me and my partner's life, you know, working at this agency. So, yeah. <laughs> but it was a, such a charming film. I had a, I had a smile on my face all the way through. That's it, fantastic. I love that. So it was. So what was the difference for you? I mean, obviously that was shot in '98. Uh, growing up when I spit in your grave was released in 2019. So I'm guessing it'd be sort of 2017, 18, when that was being put together. What? Which yeah, one? What do earlier, you prefer? Actually. What do you prefer? Doing a documentary or doing a narrative? Or do you just you love know, them both? They, they were both completely different beasts. And I'll tell you something. I think it's harder to make a documentary than it is to make a movie. Uh, with a movie, you have a script that you're following. With a documentary, you just have to constantly film talking heads and then make a story out of that. So I found the documentary to be more – and I don't want to use the word difficult because you know it's just more time-consuming. So it was very time-consuming to make a documentary, but – what I really loved about the narration of Holy Hollywood, I loved working with actors. I, I, I loved the, the chemistry between other characters uh, on the on the screen, and you know, and a lot of times, you know, I just I just feel a big connection with the characters, and I let them be free and ad lib if they want. And Candy Warhol, who's played <laughs> by Dan Zukowski, Dan Zukowski was the pizza boy in Home Alone. He's the wow. famous pizza boy in that scene. Did not know. And okay. so he, you know, he auditions for the role of Cam of uh, actually at the time it was called Levon. My drag queen character was named Levon. And when he got the part, he decided, you know, hey Terry, why don't we call this character Candy Warhol? I said, I love it. Let's do it. So we called the character Candy Warhol and and Candy Warhol is my favorite character in the whole movie. I have to admit it. You know, I mean, yeah. she's just amazing as Candy, and I, I really, I really enjoy that that character and what Dan did with with that character. I think you've got a great mix of characters in the entire film, though. Yeah, yeah, there are a big mix in there. Yeah, and Tony Tarantino plays Dick Richards well. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah I, w I would probably suspect there's quite a lot of uh bigger casting agents that are very much like dick richards if not more crazy than right, dick richards true, true so true <laughs> yeah <laughs> so very true but no it was a charming film and yeah i love going into a film not knowing what i'm gonna watch i generally prefer to do that anyway and uh and when i find a gem which i did with holy hollywood it, it's so much more rewarding for me i think that's very nice of you to say that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So, what is next for you? What What are you? Are you going to go back into a documentary type thing? Are you going to go into more narrative? You know, I've you know. got different things that are possibilities on my plate right now, and so I'm. You know, I've been pretty much immersing myself. You know, in the spit world. You know, and just keeping the franchise moving and everything. Um, so there's there's more spit to come. If anything, you know, uh, whether it's going to be another doc or another narrative, um, there will be more spit to come. So do expect that in, in the future, for sure. And that's probably going to be part of my future. 
Uh, wait, what's your take on the sequel? Because I've seen the, fir- the very first one. I saw, I am going to go back and watch them all, but what, what can I expect from, from I Spit on Your Grave 2 two and 3? That's the one. 4 is deja vu, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. R- really, yeah, you can say so. That was the fourth, yeah, or, or is it, what, yeah, the fourth. The yeah. fourth film, but actually the second one in the, the Jennifer Hills so, so when you line. say when you say the sequel, which one are you referring to? That, that is the question because it's like it's one of these timelines. It's a bit like the X Men or, or um, what's the other? I'm trying to think of something else where they sort of splinter off into different. You can watch them in any order you wish. So right. the, other than the the Camille Keaton films, the others are are they standalone or are they? Somehow, yeah, the yeah? I Spit in the Grave Part Two with Gemma Dallander. Mm-hmm. Um, who who was British, I believe. Uh, she it, that movie was an entirely different story based around the same subject matter, right. and that was written by Tom Fenton and uh, and, and Mayor Zarkin. He, he produced all of the the trilogy. You know the the 2010. The yep. 2013 and the 2015. So the 2013 is a standalone. The 2015 is the sequel to the remake. We bring back uh, Sarah Butler as the modern Jennifer Hills and what happens in her life the few years after her ordeal from the remake. So, you know, we have what we have here is we have the remake and the 2015 with the modern Jennifer Hills. And then we have the 1978 and I Spit in the Grave Deja Vu from 2019 with the original Jennifer Hills. And each Jennifer Hills goes through different experiences in the sequels, which is rather fascinating, which, yeah. you know, which it should be that way. It's, if it would be the same, it wouldn't be uh, interesting. No. This is, this is me because uh, I'm a bit of a wimp when it comes to certain genres of horror films. So I will, as I'd mentioned before, psych myself up going, right, I'm ready to watch it. I'm ready to watch it. And I'm ready to watch it. And I think I am ready to go back and tackle all the movies in the series over the next right. few days. So I'm like, right, gotcha. what, what am I going to expect? It took me, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see Texas Chainsaw Massacre until I was 28. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, because wow. I don't want to see people getting chopped up by chainsaw. That sounds horrific. Why would I want to watch that? It's now in my top 10 favorite movies ever. Um, Mine too. I, Mine I love too. it. And there's very little blood in it. So who knew? Um, my father took me to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre in New York City in a movie theater uh, for a matinee. And, you know, we both walked out and, you know, here I am, a teenager. You know? And I walked out of that and I, you know, he really enjoyed the movie. He, he liked it a lot. I remember he always speaks about it very highly. Yeah. And I remember me walking out thinking the same thing, like, wow, I love what I just experienced. Yes, it's a horrifying film, but, you know, there was something about it that was just so well done and cleverly made. You know, that just left me with something. And, you know, that's what's so powerful about it is that it leaves you with something. It's And this is why I think that I Spit on Your Grave would sit in the same shelf as Last House on the Left and Texas Chainsaw is because it's not just about what you see. It's about what you feel days, hours, weeks, months, 45 years after you've watched the film. It's the feeling that, that sort of inhabits your brain once yeah. the credits have gone. And that's why I compare those three films, because all three do that to me. Yeah, and I think that may be the secret of, of good filmmaking. Uh, whether you think it's a good movie or not, that's, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But I think as long as you can allow your audience to walk away with something in their stomach, you, you know, something, something in them, the feeling it, you know, that is something that is difficult to achieve. It's very difficult to achieve, no matter what kind of subject matter you're, you're uh, making your story about. Yep. So, yeah, I think that may be the secret to it. <laughs> Don't tell anybody else because they'll all start, exactly. doing it. They'll all start <laughs> making them. <laughs> Actually, I'd love to tell everybody, and let's get more movies like this out there. You know? Definitely. I 100%, yeah. 100% agree. But I am going to spring for the 4K restoration. Um, after having a conversation with yourself and seeing how gorgeous the reds look on the flashback sequences. Oh, um, yes. Oh, yes, you will see. <laughs> I'm also very excited about the extras because I love commentaries. I think 
I just wish more people would listen to commentaries. A lot of people, you know, I don't listen to them. Why don't you listen to them? They're amazing. They're like film schools. Listen to oh, them. Oh, still, you still have the Mayor Zarki commentary mm. on the 78th, the Joe Bob Briggs, which is extremely illuminating and entertaining uh, on the 78th. Um, and and there's a, a location uh, a location revisit you know with uh, the UK release also uh, there's um, basically it's also your, your a, documentary your documentaries in there isn't it oh my documentaries there in there as don't well. don't forget to mention that <laughs> thank you for bringing that up <laughs> <laughs> there's an interview with the film historian Chris Pogiali. Um it, it there's a lot of fun things in there you'll 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 this will really fulfill your appetite or just a cinephile that wants to learn more about this is the this is the go-to you know this this will really fill you up with all the information that you're looking for and then some it will you could end up with a degree on uh i'm not going to say i spit in your grave so you can end up with a degree about day of the woman so we'll... there you go my father would like that I'll let, him, I'll let him know you said that i'm sure he'll be hearing this but i will tell him i'll speak to him afterwards and I'll tell him that you, that you said that, and he'll be very pleased, because he does cherish that title, Day of the Woman, much more than I spit on your grave. I can assure you of that. I, I might even, and I'm not even kidding, I might amend my, uh, my website articles and stuff to now call it Day of the Woman, brackets, also known as I spit on your grave. <laughs> I, may, I may actually do that, but I'll have to keep both titles in, otherwise to, people yeah. will not know what I'm talking about. They will but, not uh, know, exactly. <laughs> That's so true. So what are you up to for the rest of your day? Obviously, this is it's all downhill from here after this conversation. Yeah, well, yeah, it is for me. My, so, yeah, you know. I got a whole day ahead of me. Yeah, you know, just doing work around the house. It's a Sunday, you know, nothing too crazy, um, you know, but all, all is good. You know, life is good over here in sunny California and uh, always looking forward to waking up and seeing what's next, you know? <laughs> well, I've got 55 minutes of deja vu to finish off watching tonight, and uh, beautiful. And I'll, you know, and then I'll try and sleep. <laughs> Don't give me nightmares. <laughs> Sounds but, great. But I've been wanting to have a conversation with you for a while. I know we've been sort of Twitter friends and stuff, and um, I yes, saw we you. Have been. I saw you online one night, and it was like, right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask you now. But I've been meaning to do it for a while. But I think with the with the issue of the 4K disc coming out, I think, like you said, it was perfect time. We'll, we'll, uh, Thank we'll, you. we'll get it done and now we've got it done I'm so glad you did I really enjoyed chatting with you and you know would look forward to chatting you with, with you again in the future at any time fantastic Terry but thank you very much you have a wonderful you. you have a wonderful day I'm going to I'm going to go and see what uh, Jamie Bernadette's up to in this final <laughs> sounds great one hour. All, right. <laughs> all right you got it have a good one thank you so much take care all right bye, -bye. bye Stuart bye bye